وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله عز وجل وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار All praise is due to Allah, we praise him, we seek his aid and we ask for his forgiveness we seek refuge and protection in Allah from the evils of ourselves and the evil consequences of our own actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, none can lead astray, and whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, none can guide. I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped. None has the right to our ultimate love and devotion but Allah alone, who has no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger. O you who believe, fear Allah as he should be feared and die not except in a state of submission and Islam to your Lord. O mankind, be dutiful to your Lord who created you from a single person and from him he created his wife and from them both he created many men and women and fear Allah through whom you demand your mutual rights and ob observe the rights of your kins. Surely Allah is ever and all watcher over you. O you who believe, keep your duty to Allah. Fear Him and speak the truth. He will direct you to righteous deeds and will forgive you your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger has indeed attained a great achievement. The best speech are the words of Allah. And the best guidance is that of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And the worst thing in the religion are the newly invented matters. For all the newly invented matters and in religion are considered to be innovation and bid'ah. Every bid'ah is misguidance and it leads to the hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kutiba alaykum usiyamu kama kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. O you who believe, Fasting has been prescribed upon you as an obligation. Just as it was prescribed for the nations and the people who came before you, so that you may attain taqwa. So the main point behind the fasting of Ramadan is taqwa, is the achievement of taqwa. And we will come to talk about the comprehensive and inclusive meaning of this beautiful term, taqwa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala precedes shortly after this to say or to talk about Ramadan شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان the month of Ramadan in which the Quran was sent down it was revealed and it contains clear signs for the guidance and mercy of humanity that shows the importance of this beautiful month that is about a week away. And one of the beautiful aspects of our Ummah, that Alhamdulillah, until today, despite the negative things that we are experiencing as an Ummah, one beautiful aspect that you will see among Muslims across the globe is that they look forward anxiously for Ramadan. They're happy about Ramadan. They get ready for Ramadan a few weeks, sometimes a couple of months before. They start looking forward to it. And that's a beautiful aspect of our Ummah. Alhamdulillah, we have been maintaining this and holding on to this beautifully. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless these efforts and these intentions. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us witness and live through the month of Ramadan and to make the best of it. 
The month of Ramadan is the peak of this year and any year. It's the best of all times during the year. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ and his companions would take this month seriously. Ramadan is not like any other month. It's not like any other time. Ramadan is special. It's a golden opportunity for us to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The things, the beautiful and positive things that combine in Ramadan, they never combine any time else. Any time else. This is why Ramadan is so special. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it so much importance. And the act of worship that is specifically linked to the month of Ramadan is fasting, as-siyam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises this act of worship and raises its position when he says in the divine hadith, al hadith al Qudusi, Kullu amal ibn Adam lahu illa sawm, fa innahu li wa ana ajzibih. All of the acts of worship, everything the son of Adam does is for him. He will reap the reward for that. Except for fasting, it is for me. Allah says, it is for him alone. Fasting, there is something special, something specific about fasting that no other act of worship shares. Only fasting holds this beauty. That Allah claims that this act of worship is exclusively for Allah. Except for fasting, it is for me. And I will reward for it. And Allah didn't name any kind of reward. And when Allah doesn't name a reward, that means it is something beyond your imagination. Something beyond your expectations. And there is a secret in the fact where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, fasting is for me. So Allah singles out fasting from amongst all the acts of worship that we know that Allah says it is for me. And there is a reason behind this. If you look at all the acts of worship, prayer, the prayer contains recitations, adhkar and dua, supplication, and it includes ruku', bowing and sujood, prostration. It has been directed to other than Allah. There are people who prostrate themselves before other than Allah. There are people who bow before other than Allah throughout the ages. Zakah, there are people who give their money for the sake of other gods, for the sake of other things other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hajj, which contains tawaf and other acts of worship, a lot of them are directed to others. You'll find in certain countries where there is ignorance of the pure Islamic belief you find people making tawaf around graves, thinking this is part of Islam. When this is polytheism, this is shirk, this is against Islam completely. So any act of worship that you can think of, you will find that humans at any time have directed it to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except for fasting. It's not known in history that people would worship an object or a person, or any type of false god through the act of fasting. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Even other nations, even talking about Christians or the Jews, when they fast their fast, you might say they are directing it to Jesus, for example. No, but we know they are directing it to Allah, although they have an issue with associating partners with Allah. And this is what Allah says in the Quran, wa ilahuna wa ilahukum wahid. Allah commands us to address the people of the book that your God and our God is one. He's the same. He's Allah. So the act of fasting is the only act of worship that has been exclusively directed for Allah. Exclusively directed for Allah. No one worships any other thing through fasting. It's only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds this beautiful act of worship in high esteem and Allah rewards abundantly for it. And this is why we need to appreciate this when, we, when you are fasting. Every day when you make the intention, every day at the night before Fajr, when you make the intention to fast that day, remember that Allah values this act of worship, that Allah loves it, that Allah appreciates it. And this makes you appreciate this beautiful act of worship and not take it for granted and not do it in, an, in a robotic way where you just go through the motions. 
No, you do it consciously. You do it because Allah loves it. And that's the meaning of worship, that we do what Allah loves out of our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what worship means. So when you do something Allah loves, this is a profound state that you put yourself into. When you do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and what He appreciates most. So again, this is the month of Ramadan that is coming soon, inshallah. And every year, now this has become a recurrent theme. Every time we talk about Ramadan, when was last Ramadan? It seemed like, like last month. It doesn't seem to have been far away in the past. It doesn't seem that a whole year has gone by. We don't feel it. We don't feel it. So this has been a recurrent theme that we all feel how time is passing on so quickly. And that means our time is on this earth is running out. But this is a very good reminder because Ramadan defies our definition of time as well. Because the Prophet وسلم, and here we come to talk about the, the merits and the virtues and the beauties of this wonderful month of Ramadan. The Prophet وسلم, says, إِذَا جَاءَ رَمَضَانٌ فُتِّحَتْ أَبْوَابُ الْجَنَّةِ وَغُلِّقَتْ أَبْوَابُ النَّارِ When Ramadan comes, the gates of paradise are open and the gates of the hellfire are closed and locked. وَصُفِّدَتِ الشَّيَاطِينَ أَوْ وَصُفِّدَتْ مَرَدَةُ الْجَانِ And the devils and the tyrants among the jinn will be chained and will be locked. Now this is for real. This is for real. The gates of paradise open. Why? Because there is mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are more people worshipping Allah. There are people putting more time for the sake of Allah. There are people who are devoting themselves more for Allah, reciting Quran, praying and fasting, and making dhikr and doing all these great active acts of worship. So because of this, this is happening because of the mercy of Allah. We worship Allah because of His mercy. Because He inspires us to do so. And He allows us to do so. And then this mercy leads to the gates of paradise being open. And the gates of the hellfire being locked. Al-Qadi Iyad rahimahullah says, This also has another meaning. It has another meaning because, because in this month, there are more people worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this leads to more mercy coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if, as if there are more people qualifying themselves for, the, for paradise, for entering paradise. So Allah opens the gates of paradise for them. And there are people who are distancing themselves from the hellfire as occurs in the end of, at the end of this hadith where the Prophet sallallahu says, وَلِلَّهِ عُتَقَاءُ مِنَ النَّارِ فِي وَذَلِكَ فِي كُلِّ لَيْلَةِ and Allah will free some people from the hellfire. And this is at every night. Allah will free some people from the hellfire. Because they have done something great and special for the sake of Allah. So Al-Qadr Iyad again says, There are people who come to Allah, who repent and start worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the point where the gates of paradise will need to be closed. وَيُنَادِي مُنَادٍ In the hadith, وَيُنَادِي مُنَادٍ يَا بَاغِيَ الْخَيْرِ أَقْبِلْ وَيَا بَاغِيَ الشَّرِّ أَدْبِرْ And a call will be proclaimed. O oh, you who intend to do good, come forward. Come forward, that's the time for it. If you have an intention, and all of us have intentions, but we always say, next year, next month, when I get this done, when I you know, pay my house off, or when I you know, retire, or when I graduate, when I get married, when I get this thing done, I will start worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I'm done with this project, I will start focusing more and worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When my kids grow, I will start doing more for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this caller, when he proclaims, he's inviting you, he says, if you have an intention, this is the time for it. Because if you're waiting for the ideal time to do something good for Allah, this might never happen. And it might never come. You have to create the time. And Allah has paved the way for you by offering you this beautiful month of Ramadan. And we all feel the surge of connection to Allah and taqwa through our hearts and through our bodies. That we find ourselves drawn to Allah, drawn to the Quran, drawn to the Masajid. 
that we want to worship Allah, that we want to feel the connection with Allah, that we want to detach a little bit more from this life and its attractions and the grip, the firm grip of our desires and the commitments of this life. We want to break loose from that. We want to experience the essence of our humanity and that's our souls connecting to Allah and our hearts connecting to the words of Allah. We enjoy standing in the presence of Allah as we pray the five daily prayers. And sometimes I draw your attention to something very important. People pay more attention to Salat al-Taraweeh than the five daily prayers. And that's the wrong approach to Allah. That's the wrong approach to Allah because there is a hype around praying Taraweeh, which is a great act of worship. But praying Fajr in Jama'ah, praying Dhuhr in Jama'ah, praying Asr in Jama'ah is far greater for you than praying 70 Ramadan's Taraweeh. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the divine hadith, al hadith al Qudusi, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبُّ مِمَّا افْتَرَضْتُ عَلَيْهِ my servant will never draw nearer to me with anything better than what I made obligatory upon him. So the five daily prayers have more precedence than any other form of prayer. But that doesn't mean we give up on taraweeh. If you find yourself drawn to the taraweeh, use it, utilize this. Because if you find yourself drawn to taraweeh, this might be the gateway that will lead you to find the beauty of salah. And this will help you to appreciate the five daily prayers more. But what I'm saying, don't let the taraweeh be your end goal. Your end goal should be to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fulfill the obligations towards Allah upon you. So you pray the five daily prayers and preferably in the masjid, in the congregation. So you find people drawn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this beautiful month. And this is just a little bit of the beauty of this wonderful month. It was narrated that the early generations, specifically the companions, six month, months before Ramadan arrives, they would start making dua to Allah to make them live long enough to witness Ramadan and fasted. That shows how much they appreciated. It shows how important Ramadan is. Because as the Prophet ﷺ says in the same hadith again, وَفِيهِ لَيْلَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِّنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرٌ And in this month there is a night and that's Laylatul Qadr. is better than a thousand months. 82, 83 years. One night you worship Allah in that night or through that night. It doesn't have to be completely through prayer. It could be reciting Quran, it could be making dhikr, it could be helping out someone, it could be any act of worship. And it would be counted in your records as if you have worshipped Allah for 83 years. We know that the, that the nations that came before us, they, they, used to, they lived a thousand years. They lived a thousand years, whereas our Prophet ﷺ says, أَعْمَارُ أُمَّتِي مَا بَيْنَ السِّتِينَ إِلَى السَّبْعِينَ My Ummah generally would live, the majority would live, between their 60s and 70s. That's the average age, average lifespan of us. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a way to match and even exceed the nations that came before. If you witness the month, only one night, Laylatul Qadr, and most likely, a person who neglects Ramadan, a person who neglects Allah throughout the year, most likely these people will not be guided to that night. And the thing with Ramadan is that it's not just a point where you switch things because we humans are not machines. You're not like a switch. You turn yourself on, you turn yourself off, or you turn your heart on, you turn it off. It doesn't work like this. If you don't prepare yourself, it's more, about a, it's more of a journey. When you grow your Iman and your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you gain more grounds, you achieve more mastery, you have more taqwa. And taqwa in Islam means, the deeper meaning of taqwa is that you develop more mastery over yourself. So you use yourself 
in a way that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in a way that benefits you in this life and in the next, instead of yourself with its desires and whims leading you here and there, where you tend to lose your life, achieving nothing. That's the meaning of taqwa. It means you take control, full control over yourself and you are able to lead it and manage it in a way that is pleasing to Allah, in a way that is fruitful and productive. That's what taqwa means. And that's why fasting has a lot of beautiful secrets that I will share with you shortly, inshaAllah. <laughs> Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba'd. Allah says that fasting has been prescribed upon us because it leads to taqwa. It leads to this kind of mastery over ourselves. It leads to us being in the driver's seat in our lives so we know where we're heading. We know how to use our time. And that our desires, our whims, and our enemy, shaitan, does not take the lead and does not drive us in ways that will destroy our hearts and destroy our future with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how does fasting lead to this kind of self-mastery? How does it get us there where we know how to align our energies and ourselves and our talents in a way that is pleasing to Allah, in a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed for us? What does fasting do to us? We develop a lot of dependency on our daily habits. And food is one of the most important things for us. We get used to having breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And sometimes even more than that. We have a brunch and we have supper. We have five, six meals a day. But our bodies don't need that much. The Prophet ﷺ says, Son of Adam would never fill a container worse than his stomach. It's enough for a human being to get a few mouthfuls, a little bit of food that will keep you alive and give you the energy to function through the day. So food was there as a provision from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us survive in this life, to help us thrive and be healthy. But what we do with food, we develop a dependency on food. We medicate ourselves with food. You feel down today? Let me eat. You feel upset? Let me eat. You want something to bite on? Let me drink something. So. It has become more of an emotional, psychological dependency on the food. We eat when we don't need. We don't even eat with a purpose. We eat to please or to feel good. We want to feel good. Or we feel negative, we feel a bit upset. We want to relieve that. How, we, how do we do it? Let's have a meal, let's eat something, let's have a bite, let's have a snack. And the things that we... This place is a burden on our bodies. It places a burden on our bodies because your, your body is busy working. Your digestive system is busy almost 24 hours digesting food that you don't need. And this is why we start piling up fat around our body. If you pile fat around your body, that means you have eaten more than you need. That's it. Your body is saying, I've had enough. I don't know what to do with the surplus food you've given me. So I'm going to store it. And you're walking around with a few pounds or a few kgs, sometimes so, so many kgs, walking around, weighing yourself down with unnecessary food. Why? To feed good. But the problem is, this kind of food and this kind of eating and drinking is actually an escape. Is an escape. Because if you have an issue, deal with it head on. Fix the source of the problem. Fix the root of the problem. You feel bad, there's a reason why you feel bad. You feel down, there is a reason why you feel that. You feel lonely, there's a reason as well. So don't medicate yourself with food or drink because that's an escape. When your feelings are not positive, this is a message that there's, there's a problem that you need to fix. 
And a lot of our feelings come, a lot of our negative feelings come from one thing. Distancing ourselves from Allah. Keeping our hearts busy with other than Allah. That's why Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala says, Inna fil qalbi sha'than la yalummuhu illa ma'rifatullahi wa mahabbatuhu wal unsu bihi wa shawq ila liqaah. So there's a sense of loss, there's a feeling of loss in the heart that cannot be medicated, that cannot be solved that cannot be treated except with knowing Allah, loving Him, enjoying His connect, the connection to Him and longing to see His face. So a lot of our negative feelings are simply because we are disconnected from Allah, because we have lost our purpose, we have lost our vision in life, not, we have lost direction. Then it takes different shapes. Someone said a word that offended me, or I went through this experience and I felt really bad about it. That's true. But that's the surface reason, or that's the immediate reason. If you search behind it, you have a lot of discomfort inside because you're so distant from Allah, and your heart is yearning and crying out for Allah, but you're not offering your heart this connection and this right of it. So when fasting comes, it says no more medication. You don't medicate yourself with food, you don't run away from your problems. Now you have an issue, face it. The other side, beautiful side of fasting here is that when you don't consume a lot of food, your body starts to heal. You will feel light. Some people even feel euphoric. It, you know, fasting gives you a beautiful, profound feeling. You feel light. You feel free. But when you are busy so much with missing your food and missing your coffee and missing your cigarette and missing other things, you do not allow yourself to enjoy this feeling. But fasting allows you or gives you a beautiful, euphoric feeling of being light, of being healthy because your body is medicating itself. Because the energy that you usually spend digesting this surplus and extra food that you are consuming, now it's directing to rebuilding your body, healing yourself. And that's why the scholars have always said one of the, one of the things that kill your heart is excessive eating. Excessive eating. So fasting, because people are falling into this excessive eating, has become, it's a culture. It's a way of life. And with a lot of you know, publicity and a lot of marketing, we just keep consuming foods because the way food is presented is very attractive. And then what happens? We lose connection with our soul because that energy that we have is supposed to take our attention to our hearts, to our soul, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why those who read Quran more in Ramadan, those who pray, that's why you find, you find it easier for you to pray more in Ramadan. You find it easier for you to recite more, more Quran in Ramadan. One of the reasons is that the energy that you used to spend to digest extra food now is saved. And you find a lot of clarity in your mind. You have a lot of sense of focus. And you are able to listen to your heart and it's yearning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you read the Quran, your mind goes deeper into the meanings. There are so many things that we can share about Ramadan. Hopefully, inshallah, in the halaqa today, I will be sharing more about Ramadan, how to, pre how to prepare ourselves for Ramadan, how to make the best of it, inshallah, how to utilize it in the best of ways. And one of the things I just want to mention now, because it's a bit relevant, the Prophet ﷺ says, Man man kana lahu mithlu ajrih. The one who offers food for a fasting person to break their fast or to open their fast at Maghrib time, they will get a similar reward. So we all have an opportunity as Muslims to double our reward for fasting and triple it multiple times. Just by offering someone, when you invite someone, this person doesn't have to be a miskeen, doesn't have to be a poor person or a person in need. Any fasting person, a friend, you invite friends, your children and your family, when you feed them, you're getting similar reward to their fast. That's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when, you know here at Abu Hurairah, we have a daily iftar for the, for, for the congregation. So there's a lot of slots still available. A lot of these slots have been taken. So people, uh, people take, uh, I mean, uh, people book days where they fund the, 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 the iftar at Abu Huraira and we have some slots still left. So I encourage you before Ramadan starts to inshallah come forward. If you are not able to do it yourself, you know, team up with two, three people and uh, sponsor an iftar one day in Ramadan and usually it's around 300 to 500 people on a daily basis. 
So inshallah, you'll be getting the reward of a huge number of people fasting, such a great reward. And don't forget Allah SWT says, إِلَّا الصَّوْمْ فَإِنَّهُ لِي وَأَنَا أَجْزِي Except for fasting, it's for me and I reward for it, I give reward for it. And that shows and that means that reward for fasting is so great. Allahumma aghfir lana dhunubana wa israfana fi amrina wa thabbit aqdamana wa ansurna ala al-qawm al-kafirin. Allahumma aghfir lana wa li walidina wa liman lahum haqqu al-halayna. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم أبرم لهذه الأمة أمر رشد يعز فيه أهل طاعتك ويذل فيه أهل معصيتك ويعمل فيه بكتابك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم كن للمستضعفين من المؤمنين في كل مكان اللهم احق دماءهم وصنع عراضهم اللهم احفظ عليهم دينهم وإيمانهم اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات ربنا اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم